Welcome everybody. We're gonna get started in just a few minutes. We're waiting for uh, a few more people to join us. Uh, just a few housekeeping um, notes before we get started. We do have everybody muted just to reduce background noise. Um, if you're having connectivity problems, you can try turning off your video feed if you have it on. Uh, we do recommend watching in speaker view. And the chat is open and please feel free to write any questions you have uh, while James is speaking and we'll be sure to get them answered um, during the program. There will be time for Q&A at the end. All right, we do have a couple more people coming on, but I'm gonna go ahead and just have some introductory remarks. Um, it is seven. So just a few quick notes. Um, we have some upcoming events. Land Trust is gonna be a busy winter. Uh, winter Carnival is February 4th through 6th. And the Land Trust is collaborating with Birch's School. Uh, students are making art that we're going to be putting up on the trails um, with a fun scavenger hunt using the Outer Spatial Trail app. Um, locations and details will be posted online um, in the week before the Winter Carnival, and we encourage you all to check that out. Um, there is a small participation prize. Uh, noticing walks with John Calabria are returning. Um, John's been giving these wonderful noticing walks since 2017. Uh, the first one will be on February 1st and locations are posted online on our website, lincolnconservation.org. In February, Barbara Peskin is going to be joining us for photographing moments in nature. She's a wonderful local photographer and she'll be giving um, some great photography tips and sharing some of her favorite uh, wildlife photos from Lincoln. And lastly, uh, we have some programs coming up end of February, early March. Uh, details are still being finalized, but John Calabria is going to give a family-friendly program about spring emergence. And Lincoln's own Michelle Grisenda, uh, the conservation director for the town, is going to be giving an evening program all about big night, um, the, the night the amphibians all cross to get to their vernal pools. Uh, so we are very excited to hear what she has to say about that. Uh, a couple quick introductory remarks. I'd like to welcome Dr. James Lowenthal, um, our evening's presenter. He is a professor of astronomy at Smith College in Northampton. Um, he received his um, bachelor's of science in physics and astronomy from Yale University and his PhD from the University of Arizona. And he is um, deeply involved in the community surrounding light pollution and um, the importance of naturally dark skies, especially with regards to wildlife um, and pollinators, which is uh, the focus of today's talk. Um, and I also wanted to note that he's very invested in promoting action to stop climate change, because I know we all care deeply about that in Lincoln, and I'm sure he'd be happy to, <laughs> not to throw this at you, James, happy to answer any questions about that that um, might seem relevant to tonight's presentation. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to turn the mic over to James and whenever you're ready, welcome. Thank you so much, Bryn. Thank you everybody for coming. And uh, Bryn, you forgot to mention that you went to Smith and that uh, you were yes. my advisee and that you were a great student. And, <laughs> yes. and I also borrowed a bike one summer. <laughs> <laughs> it's so nice to reconnect this way. And also, um, it's nice to connect, especially personally for me with Lincoln, where uh, I have a long history. My uh, aunt Betty Levin still lives there, and uh, she and her husband, my uncle Alvin Levin, were very active in environmental issues. And 
Uh, I know a lot of, of old timers in Lincoln, Ellen Raja and Jane Langton and a bunch of other people who probably many of you know. Anyway, thank you all so much for, for coming tonight uh, and uh, let's get started. Like moths to the flame, pollinators need dark nights. Here you see a view from Hadley, Massachusetts of a cottonwood tree uh, in an early summer evening with the stars wheeling behind. Everything in that picture was affected by light pollution. What is light pollution? This is a picture in downtown Northampton. Light pollution is light that's too bright or light that is poorly aimed. It goes in the wrong direction. Light that especially shines outward or upward or light that shines onto a property that's uh, not necessarily the property where it started. Maybe it was not even intended. Uh, light that's on maybe all night long, even when it's not useful, such as uh, this picture in Northampton where uh, the parking lot's completely empty, but uh, the light stays on at full brightness all night long. Why is this a problem? A lot of reasons. Here are the main ones. It's bad for human health. It's bad for human safety. For example, this light at Tanglewood, where probably many of you have gone uh, in summer for uh, concerts of the Boston Symphony Orchestra. This outdoor light is shining right in your eyes. The goal of the light was to illuminate the ground. You're supposed to see the ground, the walkway, the path. It's supposed to make it safer to walk, but instead the light's shining right in your eyes. That's bad for human safety. It wastes money and energy. Uh, light that goes up into the sky uh, costs money uh, and uh, takes energy to produce, but it does no good at all. It's a total waste. Of course, it ruins the view of the night sky. It ruins the view of the Milky Way, the view of the stars, and it's bad for wildlife. A little bit more on all of these things. Uh, how is blue light at night especially bad for human health? Light at night, light pollution is associated with numerous serious problems for human health, including elevated rates of cancer. Uh, it's so bad that the World Health Organization has deemed shift work a probable carcinogen. And the probable cause of the shift work being a problem is the, the use of artificial light at night. Uh, close to home here at Harvard, one of the major studies in this field is called the Harvard Nurse Study, a longitudinal study over many years of over 100,000 nurses uh, that found conclusive evidence for elevated rate of breast cancer among those subjects who lived in light polluted areas. This has been confirmed by numerous studies. Now, multiple studies around the world, including this one in Spain, that found cancer rates as high as one and a half to two times higher in the presence of artificial light at night. How could this be? How could light have any connection to cancer? It's actually fairly simple. We are programmed to look for the amount of blue light in our view. When the sun goes down, the amount of blue light drops dramatically. Our eye detects that and sends a signal to the brain, a, a part of the brain that then says, hey, it's nighttime, start producing melatonin. And melatonin is a really important hormone. Uh, some of you may take melatonin when you're traveling to, uh, to try to reset your body clock. Melatonin regulates your circadian rhythms, your 24 hour clock and it cascades through your entire body where it has dramatic effects on uh, your respiration, your uh, digestion, metabolism, uh, sleepiness, wakefulness, the function of, of virtually every organ is affected by this melatonin triggered uh, hormone cascade. And melatonin is a powerful cancer inhibitor. So light at night doesn't necessarily cause cancer, but it, uh, it enables the the growth of cancer by inhibiting a cancer suppressant. There's a particular problem that's new, that's especially bad. And that is that it's the blue light that your eye is sensitive to, is looking for to, to tell your brain, oh, uh, it's time to start producing melatonin, it's nighttime. Blue light is especially produced by new LED lights that are now flooding the market and that uh, the world is just, uh, is just falling all over itself to install, often in the name of uh, protecting against climate change because LEDs uh, are, are, are efficient. Uh, so here's the problem from the human health perspective. In the old days, we had fire. 
uh, fire produces almost no blue light. Here is the spectrum showing lots of red light. Firelight is kind of reddish, almost no blue light at all. Again, that blue light is the light that your eye is looking for to, to, to determine is it time to start turning on melatonin. Uh, then we had incandescent lights, which also had almost no blue light at all. Uh, they were wasteful. They produced lots of infrared light that is invisible. It didn't do any good. Um, so let's replace all those with LEDs, shall we? Great. All the light is coming out here in the visible, uh, not in the infrared where it's, where it's wasted. That's great. But there's this problem. LEDs produce a lot of blue light. And that blue light is exactly a direct hit with your eye sensitivity uh, where it's looking for melatonin. And this now means that uh, the new lights we have, LED lights, are suppressing melatonin much, much more uh, than we've ever experienced before. Here's the American Medical Association on this problem. Uh, it says, don't use lights outside that are any bluer than 3000K. This is on the Kelvin scale. This is how we measure blueness. The larger the number, the bluer the light. Don't go any bluer than 3000K for outdoor lighting. And furthermore, avoid glare for the safety reasons we talked about before. What does that glare thing mean? Well, here's a picture of a light that's shining in all directions. Only this light that's going down is useful. The area to be lit is down here. This light should not be used to try to illuminate a building over here or the, a parking lot over here. If it does, then it's, a, it's, it's sending out light in the glare zone or even sending light directly upward, which does nobody any good at all. Only this light coming down is the useful light. And here's a, a picture. There are many of these cartoons available online. Here's a building with two lights on it, one on the side that's shining in all directions, including onto this neighboring house, and another on this side that's shining down only. It's much more respectful of the neighbors, the stars, wildlife, uh, every living creature within sight of that light. And this is a, a serious problem when we think about the whole goal of the light. Again, it's to make safety enhanced. But we all know that safety is completely uh, reduced if a flashlight shines in your eye in the middle of the night. You can't see anything. So here's a, a, the view from a, a driver uh, inside a car navigating a parking lot with a, a bright light shining right in their eyes. They can't see that there are some pedestrians crossing the road right there. And if only that light were better shielded, like the picture on the light on the right, then you would have exactly what you want, which is enhanced visibility, not uh, worsened visibility. Uh, the, uh, the issue has been studied extensively. Uh, this is not a new issue. Back in the 1970s, there were some researchers who, who found that with no light shining in your eyes at night, you can see uh, on, uh, more than 700 feet down the road. With the headlights of an oncoming car shining in your eyes, uh, that might be reduced to only 200 feet. It's a very dramatic effect. We all know what that's like uh, from um, uh, firsthand experience. This is such a serious issue that the Federal Highway Administration says glare is one of the most important elements to control in a lighting system. Again, this has nothing to do with the environment yet. This is just for human health. Uh, it affects your ability to adequately see, particularly for older drivers. That's because eyes get less transparent. They get more opaque with age. And that means the light that enters them gets scattered, uh, which uh, causes this so-called disability glare or a veil of, of luminance. Uh, it, it, um, well, it's bad. It reduces visibility. Light pollution is a pure waste of money and it's a pure waste of energy. This slide summarizes some of the numbers. Um, roughly $3 billion of electricity wasted a year in the United States alone, illuminating the sky, sending light directly into the sky. And this does not account at all for all of the ancillary effects that we'll talk more about. This is directly paying to generate electricity and shining it directly into the sky. Light pollution robs us of the stars. Here are uh, pictures of downtown Northampton on the left on a mostly clear winter night and from Smith College's field station, McLeish Field Station, just 11 miles outside of town. On the left in Northampton, some of the brightest stars in the sky, you can barely see them as they rise over the light polluted skies of Northampton. This is a small town. This is a town of 30,000 people and the Milky Way completely obliterated. Whereas on the right, just 11 miles out of town, uh, a much, much 
uh, more beautiful natural view of the sky, of the stars, the constellations, the Milky Way, and a, a comet that uh, was in the beginning of the of the video. We astronomers uh, tend to rate the quality of the sky on many different scales. This is one of them. It's called the Bortle scale. On the Bortle scale, it runs from one to nine. One is a pristine dark sky. There are very few places in the world remaining that are a Bortle one. Uh, Bortle nine would be Las Vegas or Times Square. Lincoln is somewhere in the five to six range at the moment. And as depicted in this picture, it's probably pretty challenging to see the Milky Way from anywhere in the town of Lincoln right now. And now we get to wildlife. Light at night is bad for wildlife, especially blue light. This screech owl is a nocturnal animal. It needs darkness at night to thrive. But guess what? All living beings need darkness at night to thrive, including diurnal animals. It is absolutely essential to have darkness at night for virtually every living creature that's been studied. It's in our DNA, literally in our DNA. And the Nobel Prize was awarded to the biologist uh, just uh, four or five years ago who discovered the DNA clockwork uh, that, uh, that controls our circadian rhythms. The nighttime is the ecosystem. 70% of mammals are nocturnal, only 20% are diurnal. Uh, this bat, of course, is nocturnal, needs darkness at night to thrive. Uh, this hardworking possum mother crossing my street here in Northampton, uh, this fox in my backyard, uh, they're all nocturnal. But of course, even diur diurnal mammals also need darkness at night when they're sleeping to get a good sleep. In the presence of light pollution, there are many important functions that are negatively affected. Virtually every species that's been studied suffers in the presence of light pollution. Reproduction suffers, foraging suffers, the ability to migrate effectively suffers. The whole ecosystem uh, depends critically on darkness at night. Here's some more specific examples. Uh, on the left, you see some examples of birds that were collected in one city, I think Denver alone, in the course of one summer alone. Uh, those were birds that were migrating and were uh, confused by uh, bright lights from Denver, crash into buildings or circle overhead until they uh, died from exhaustion. It's estimated that uh, this number is, is a very low uh, number. It shouldn't be millions. Yes, it's millions. It's hundreds of millions. It's as much as a billion birds per year killed in the United States alone. On the right, you see a, a sea turtle. Uh, this is a famous sort of poster child for uh, the, the negative effects of light pollution. Um, uh, sea turtles uh, come ashore, lay their eggs. When the eggs hatch, the, the babies are programmed to look for the lights of the stars twinkling on the water and to head for the water. They have only a few minutes to get to the water safely before they're picked off by predators or they die of dehydration. What happens now? The eggs hatch, the, the turtles come out, they head for the mall. They see the lights the other direction and they head away from the ocean. Uh, it's a, a serious problem that is imperiling this entire species. What about migrating birds in particular? 80% uh, of birds that migrate, migrate at night. So 40% of birds are migratory. 80% of those migrate at night. And many of them use the stars to navigate. All of these are migrating warblers that I photographed within a mile of my house here in Northampton. They were on their way up from the Caribbean or even South America on their way to Canada to spend the summer. What would happen if they couldn't see the stars. Maybe they would wind up like this yellow-throated vireo uh, that died in Northampton after that long trip up from the Caribbean, part of that 100 million to a billion birds per year that uh, die from light pollution. Not just uh, birds, uh, not just animals, uh, not just birds uh, above water, fish and amphibians also affected by, uh, by light pollution. Atlantic salmon uh, are disrupted by light at night. This is a short list of some of the institutes that focus specifically on this issue, the issue of the negative effects of light pollution on wildlife. Uh, my colleague, Mary Harrington here at Smith College, uh, unfortunately, Richard Stevens, one of the leaders in this field just passed away uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, he was at UConn for many years. 
Um, here's um, the, uh, a screenshot from the website of the Zoological Lighting Institute, an institute that is devoted to this one issue. Uh, very close to you, there are some experts at, uh, at Tufts who study these animals, fireflies, everybody's favorite insects. Uh, here in my, my neighborhood in Northampton, as the stars wheel overhead, uh, thousands of fireflies blink to each other, communicating their need to find each other to mate in a neighbor's backyard that's dark enough that the fireflies like it there. But the fireflies are very sensitive to light pollution. They don't like it. They avoid it. And it makes sense, of course, in the presence of light pollution, it's harder for them to see each other. They need to see each other across that dark field to find the right species. Their, their blinking is a code. There are many species of fireflies and their uh, the, the pattern of their blink is a code that says, oh, I'm one of you, come find me. So that come hither signal is, uh, is imperiled in the presence of light pollution. Uh, here's another example from the island in the middle of the Connecticut River, of thousands upon thousands of fireflies uh, as the moon sets in the background. Uh, this is just a couple of years ago. Uh, the fireflies signaling it to each other on this uh, July 4th night. This is my favorite kind of fireworks. So an expert, world expert on this issue is in your backyard, uh, Avalon Owens, working in the lab of Sarah Lewis. Avalon o Owens is a graduate student in the Department of Biology at Tufts. And I know that, uh, that you've had uh, talks from, from Sarah and or Avalon before, and I'm happy to, uh, to be able to count them among our local colleagues and experts in this field. Um, Avalon has written papers uh, talking uh, about studying the effect of artificial light at night, Alan, on all insect species. Many of you are aware that uh, there's likely something called the insect apocalypse underway, a dramatic drop in the number of insects worldwide. And uh, Avalon Owens and, and her, her team have been instrumental in, um, in bringing to the foreground the issue, the importance of light pollution in, uh, in that dramatic worldwide, worldwide reduction in the number of insects. And here she writes about uh, light pollution as a driver of insect declines uh, and uh, talks about the, the importance of recognizing uh, Alan among habitat destruction and, and, uh, and other causes. Remember, if we destroy the night, we are essentially destroying the habitat. It's not just the uplight that astronomers are so concerned about, it's also downlight. Light that shines down is shining onto insects, it's shining onto habitat, it's shining onto animals, it's shining onto ecosystems. Uh, so it's great for astronomy to keep the light shining down, uh, but it is, it is not sufficient for protecting wildlife. Here uh, are some uh, news pieces. Some of her work has gotten a lot of uh, traction. I'm very happy to see uh, pictures and uh, stories about the insect apocalypse. Um, here is a picture in my backyard from the place where I try to set up my telescope on clear nights. And these insects are attracted to the streetlight outside my house. They should not be there. They should be off doing what they're supposed to be doing. They should be uh, foraging for food and mating uh, and, and pollinating. Instead, they're spending their, their whole night uh, buzzing around the streetlight where they're going to die of exhaustion or they're going to get picked off by predators. Uh, here's a list from some of Avalon Owen's work. Uh, detailing the different ways in which light pollution affects insects and many different uh, kinds of insects. And, and uh, you can uh, follow this, follow up on this in more detail in your own time. But uh, you see here a very nice summary of some of the effects uh, from foraging to reproduction, to predation to um, uh, development to movement. It's estimated that there are over 5 million species of insects. Only 1 million of those have even been described by biologists. Of those, there are nearly 200,000 species that are Lepidoptera. That includes butterflies and moths. Almost all of those are nocturnal, so they're very sensitive to light pollution. What happens? What are the effects of artificial light at night on these nocturnal insects? Well, some estimates are that as many as one third of insects are attracted to stationary light sources. This is that fatal attraction, like moths to the flame. As many as one third of those die before the morning. 
either uh, dropping dead from exhaustion or getting picked off uh, by predators, uh, maybe maybe bats or, or other nocturnal predators. Uh, this has been estimated in Germany to, to kill as many as 100 billion insects per year. That's just in Germany alone. This has potential to compound uh, many other large-scale declines. And uh, here I quote one paper that uh, that estimates uh, that um, over the 30 years that they were studying uh, large moths, uh, that nocturnal species underwent much steeper declines than diurnal species due to attraction to light. Uh, it's not just the, the nocturnal species, it's also the diurnal species that are affected. The whole ecosystem is affected. And of course, we depend on, uh, on pollinators like this for uh, our entire uh, food web. Uh, this also has gotten a fair amount of, of press. Uh, you might have seen this article in the New York Times about the pleasures of moth watching, um, which is uh, one pleasure that, that may have numbered nights, so to speak. Uh, this may not be something we'll be able to do in the future if we don't uh, effectively control light pollution. Here is another paper talking about the effect specifically on pollinators of light pollution. And uh, here uh, is uh, 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 public press responding to a different paper uh, that estimates that as, as much as 62% decline in the number of visits by pollinating insects uh, to flowers in the presence of artificial light at night. So what they did is the, in a uh, mountain field in Switzerland that was naturally dark, they put artificial light in and measured the, the number of insects that came or didn't come. 62% decline in the presence of artificial light at night. And during the day, the next day, as much as a 20 or more percent decline in visits by pollinators. So the insects just left the area or they were killed. Here in Northampton, there's a great effort underway by volunteers to plant pollinator gardens. It's part of Western Mass Pollinator Network. I'm sure many of you are uh, in cahoots with this great bunch. Uh, this picture from our Pulaski Park right in downtown Northampton uh, shows some of the beautiful plantings done by the volunteers, uh, specially designed plantings to attract insects during the day. But then what do we do? We kill them by night. We zap them with these super bright lights that the city installed. These lights are 4,000 Kelvin. That's much too blue. And they're super bright. They're as much as 10 or 15 times brighter than some city parks in New York City. But the city of Northampton says, oh no, we have to have these for safety. What kind of safety are we talking about here? Is it to stop this guy from, well, what do you think happened? I'll tell you what happened. He was perfectly safe and healthy until he sat down on this park bench under the light. And now look what happened. No, I'm just kidding. Of course, um, he's drunk. Uh, he he uh, fell asleep on this park bench. The point is this super bright, super blue light does nothing to prevent this kind of behavior, which was the intent. Oh, we, we don't want this kind of bad behavior. It does nothing. All it's doing is, is uh, making this environment unhealthy for everybody, including the pollinators we're trying to attract by day. And of course, some people even use light to attract pollinators or to attract insects intentionally. This is a bug light. It's a bug zapper. It's meant to attract mosquitoes, but in fact, mosquitoes are a very small percentage, only a couple percent or so of the actual insects that are attracted and killed. So mostly beneficial insects are getting killed by this bug light in uh, Hadley, uh, just over the river from Northampton. Uh, here's a study that found, sure enough, when lights are bright, lots of insects are, um, uh, are killed. And when lights are dimmed, many fewer insects are killed. Uh, here is a study showing that, sure enough, when uh, uh, there are bright street lights shining on bushes, like this hedgerow here, this is in the United Kingdom, or on this grass margin by the side of the, uh, the road, uh, that there are fewer insects found than in dark areas. So uh, one would be same number of insects in, in light polluted versus dark areas. Uh, less than one would be fewer insects. So in every case, there are fewer insects uh, in the lit areas. And it's worst in the case of bright LEDs. 
it's best in the case over here of LPS, that's low pressure sodium lights. Those, that's the, uh, and high pressure sodium lights, HPS, those are the lights we mostly grew up with, those sort of orange, yellowish street lights that we're now getting rid of in favor of mostly blue LEDs. So we're going the wrong direction uh, if we're trying to protect insects. All of these effects have been documented extensively in the literature. I've shown you some examples. The United Nations level, International Union for Conservation of Nature, IUCN, has a task force devoted to uh, fighting light pollution. They came out with a resolution last year uh, that said the impacts of artificial light at night affect many biological groups, both flora and fauna, vertebrate and non-vertebrate, and that a large proportion of animals live partially or exclusively at night, and a daily period of darkness is essential for all living organisms to alternate periods of rest and activity. And they have these recommendations, avoid overlighting, turn off the lights at night, avoid upward lighting, um, avoid any illumination of a natural area, uh, limit glare, minimize blue light. Similar results from this United Nations level report, which I helped organize and contribute and, uh, and write. Uh, this is called Dark and Quiet Skies for Science and Society. And there was a bioenvironment working group that I chaired. The bioenvironment chapter of the report, it is all available online, uh, says artificial light at night can have significant effects on organisms and reduce the resilience of populations. We compiled here uh, nearly 100 pages of, uh, of uh, text and references uh, calling on some of the world experts in numerous fields on uh, uh, in biology and, um, uh, and especially artificial light at night and its effects. Uh, we detailed extensively the effects on aquatic organisms, birds, insects, mammals, uh, including all the, uh, uh, the, the, the functions that I've mentioned previously. And we came up with essentially the same recommendations that the IUCN did. Avoid unnecessary illumination, avoid excessive illumination, use controls so that the light is turned off or dimmed late at night. Um, avoid uh, sending out the light sideways, keep it limited, uh, minimize the amount of blue light. Here's the problem, it's getting worse, not better. Despite all of these studies, all of this knowledge, it's getting worse. Here's a map of light pollution in the United States from the 50s, from the 70s, from the 90s. Here's a projection, get ready, 2025. Everything east of the Mississippi is a solid mess of light pollution. There's no more dark left anywhere. Here's a worldwide study that uh, came out in 2017 by Chris Kaiba, showing that light pollution is growing at more than 2% per year worldwide. That's twice the rate of population growth. That means more people are using light per capita. Here's a more recent study from just last year showing that light pollution is up at least 49% starting just in 1992. It could be as much as 400%. The problem is that we measure this often by looking down at the earth from satellites the satellites miss a lot of the blue light that is produced by LEDs. So if LEDs were mostly uh, replacing high pressure sodium lights and they were mostly 3000 K LEDs, well, then light pollution has grown this much, but we haven't measured it properly. Instead, if light, if LEDs are going in that are 4000 K LEDs more blue, then we've actually missed even more light and light pollution has grown this much since 1992. Let's get more local. Here's Lincoln. Here's a light pollution map from 2012. Red is worse. Green is getting better. Uh, uh, blue is the best available on this map. Here's 2012. Get ready for 2021. There's 2021. Here's 2012 again. 2021. I go back and forth several times. You can see the light pollution creeping into those green valleys, spreading out from Boston and the suburbs. Everywhere you look, light pollution has gotten worse, not better, just in this very short time, in less than a decade. And the, the color coding here is, again, on the Bortle scale, showing that Lincoln is now moving from a, from a five towards a six or even a seven on the Bortle scale. Uh, here is a 
a measurement specifically from Lincoln. And this map, by the way, is, uh, is available. It's called lightpollutionmap.info. Uh, and you can look it up uh, yourself and go anywhere in the world and see what the light pollution is for any year in the last uh, decade. Uh, here is the, the timeline of uh, estimated of Lincoln's light pollution over the last uh, decade or so. And here is uh, a measurement of numbers from 2015 showing that in 2015, the sky, the night sky over Lincoln was about seven times, here's that 6.84, about seven times brighter than natural night sky. So all the organisms living in Lincoln, including you, depend on a dark night sky at, at night, but you're not getting it. Uh, what you're getting is seven times brighter than natural. And that was in 2015, and it's here gotten probably 50% worse since then, or, or maybe not that much, but it's gotten worse. How does it happen? How is it getting so much worse? Here is the street outside my house. Um, uh, here's a street light. I took this picture at a time when the street light was broken. Um, this is when the street light was on, and this was the old uh, high pressure sodium light. I knew they were about to replace it. Here's what they replaced it with. Get ready. That's the new LED light outside my street, outside my house on my street. And that's supposed to be a dark sky friendly light. You be the judge. Uh, here again is Pulaski Park in Northampton with those terrible lights that the city put in uh, against our uh, strenuous uh, objections. How do we fix this problem? How are we gonna fix it? First of all, the light should go down only, not up. Um, this is a bad light. Here's a good light, the light goes down. Here's a bad light uh, on this, whoops, bad light on the side of a building going uh, out sideways uh, and up into the sky and onto the neighbor, neighboring building. Here's a good light, the light goes down only. Uh, these lights are all bad. They all go, there, there's the lights going in all directions. These lights are all good, the lights going down only. Here's a summary from very bad to best. Uh, here's a sort of map of, of a, a typical uh, ye olde um, carriage lamp that I'm sure, I'm sorry to say, some of you might even have in your front yards. <laughs> it's probably your neighbors do. And it, it, it's old fashioned. It was designed to have one candle in it. Instead, it has a light bulb that is putting out 500 candles worth of light. And only some of that is going down productively. Uh, a, more than half of it is going up into the sky, wasted and into the glare zone. Don't install lights like this. This is a major problem in, in this day and age. Now with LEDs being absolutely standard, uh, every parking lot owner in the country, the world is buying an LED light that's, that's designed like this and unfortunately has this hinge on it and they're installing it the wrong way. They're installing it like this. Instead, they should install it like that, <clears throat> horizontal. You know what they were thinking. They were thinking, ah, I gotta send the light over sideways to light up my parking lot. But guess what? It would do just as well horizontal. It would actually do better because now the light is not gonna be shining in your eyes from half a mile away. So we would reduce glare and we'd reduce light pollution if we would just install the lights the right way. We all know this already. We know that if you go to your, your favorite live theater, like the theater here at Smith College, the lights are carefully designed by people who've taken classes on how to do this so that the light shines on the stage, not in the eyes of the audience. This works great, right? When you're sitting there in the audience, you can turn to your neighbor and see your neighbor perfectly well, and you can see everything that's happening on the stage because the light's not blinding you. That's what we should do outside as well. Number two, we have to minimize the amount of blue light at night. This is essential. Here is light that was installed at a new development in Northampton. Uh, the city didn't understand what they were doing. They approved this. I would hate to live in this house with that blue light shining in my window all night long. I would have to install $500 uh, blackout shades on each window of the house. Many cities are doing the right thing, choosing lights that are minimal blue. Uh, here is a list of some of them. Uh, here they're color coded. Uh, Northampton at least chose 3000 not blue, or they could have been worse. Um, but it could have been better. Wellesley has chosen 2,700K. Pepperell and Rockport here are choosing 2,200K, like this amber LED light. The technology is there. It can be done. We just have to make the right decisions. 
If we ever put in streetlights, if we have to, they should be like this. If we put in streetlights at all, and for the most part, the default should be no, unless it is proven that they're needed, no lights, the way uh, the New Zealand, uh, the country of New Zealand default is no light except when needed. If we do, then we should control it and the light should be on only when needed. This is a very simple, uh, cheap controller that can replace the controller on most street lights. Most street lights just have a controller that says, oh, it's dark, turn the light on. And then the sun comes up and they turn the light off. Instead, this has a timer built in, very simple, uh, that, that says, oh, after midnight or whenever you can control it, you can change it. After midnight, after 2 a.m., turn the light down to 50% of its brightness or to 25% or 10% of its brightness or turn it off completely when nobody's there. Why should street lights be on all night long when nobody's using it? All it's doing is harming uh, the, the ecosystem for everybody and harming uh, human health and wasting energy. Here are the five rules that the, uh, the two major organizations that govern this issue have come up with. Those organizations are the International Dark Sky Association. I lead the Massachusetts chapter uh, and the Illuminating Engineering Society. Those are sort of our, our, our frenemies uh, who we've fought with over many years, but uh, we got together uh, to come up with motherhood and apple pie sort of rules that we could agree on. These are five common sense rules. Light at night should be useful. It, there should not be a useless light out there. Every light should have a clear purpose. Targeted, it should go down only or onto its target only, not in all directions. Use low light levels. Don't use more than you need. Certainly not 10 times more than you need like Northampton. Uh, should be controlled so that it goes off when, it's, when nobody's there. Um, and use warmer colors, not, not blue. Massachusetts is one of the, is the only state in New England that has not passed legislation affecting light pollution. We have a bill, here are its numbers in the Senate and the House, that is for about the 10th time before the state legislature. It's currently in the TUE committee, the Telecommunications uh, Utilities and Energy uh, Committee. It has been uh, voted out of that committee in the past only to die elsewhere in the process. Uh, we have a lot of support from Sierra Club and other land trusts. If there's one thing you could do, uh, Lincoln Land Trust, it would be right in support of this bill and that would be much appreciated. Here's what it calls for. These are similar to the five things I just mentioned, the five uh, uh, principles of responsible outdoor lighting. The light should, any light that is sponsored by uh, state government or city government in Massachusetts should go down only, should be not too blue, um, should be no brighter than necessary. The Department of Transportation has to use best practices. It, they're one of the major problems. And the utilities um, have to stop charging you, city of Lincoln, town of Lincoln, or any other city or town for more than you're actually using. Uh, that's obviously a disincentive to dim your lights um, and that has to change. So to summarize, uh, bad lights on the left, good lights on the right. Light pollution is bad for animals, all animals, all plants, human health, public safety, the economy, quality of life, and it's bad for our view of the stars. We can fix it easily by using light only intelligently when and where it's needed, by eliminating glare and uh, light trespass, by minimizing, minimizing blue light, and by controlling the light levels so that uh, uh, we're using only the, the amount that we need. All life needs darkness at night. If you took the water away from this pond, we all know what would happen. The frogs would die. The water is their ecosystem but a dark night is equally their ecosystem. The frogs have evolved to depend on darkness at night. I'll leave you with this video of Comet Neowise setting over the Connecticut River, a rich riparian ecosystem full of uh, plant and animal species of all kinds in land, sea, and air, land, water, and air, all of them threatened by light pollution from Route 9 that's just behind me. Northampton on my left, Hadley on my right. Thank you very much for your attention, for uh, your efforts to conserve the ecosystem in, in, in all its ways. And I'm happy to um, engage in discussion now and hear what your thoughts are. 
Thank you. That was really interesting. And I, I learned a lot. I always learn a lot. <laughs> um, so are you out there at night unscrewing the street lights? You got your ladder ready and you go one by one yep. in the night? <laughs> Don't, tell. <laughs> Don't tell, but yes. <laughs> yeah. I do it one light bulb at a time and, you know, and United Nations uh, and, and everything in between. That's great. Well, thank you. Uh, we do have a few questions and um, folks, please write any questions into the chat and we will get to them right now. Um, Alicia writes um, about the LED lights, um, which are a great thing because they're more energy efficient. And I think you, you sort of answered this question, but maybe you could just reiterate. Um, are, are the new color, the, the warmer colored LEDs, um, the best better. choice, climate, climate yes. efficient and, yep. and better for, yeah. for light pollution? Absolutely. Yeah. It's not LEDs uh, that are, it's not that LEDs are inherently bad. It's that uh, LEDs come in all different kinds and there are good ones and there are bad ones. And you have to be educated about the choice and we have to educate the regulators to stop uh, to stop the manufacturers from producing and selling the bad ones, especially for outdoor use. I have LEDs um, all through my house, uh, but we've chosen them carefully. The, mm -hmm. And the, the three main things are the ones we touched on, the color, the brightness, and the direction. Uh, and uh, I, I'm happy to talk in more detail about all of these things, but specifically for outdoor use, all those three are, are crucial. Uh, yes, the color of LEDs, uh, it, it, the technology is totally there. The best LEDs that I can recommend now for your porch, for example, if you must have a porch light on and that light should just be off unless you're using it. You should not leave the light on all night long. But if you have a porch light on, uh, you can, especially if you have a dimmer on that porch light, there are, you all know from the old days when you would dim down an incandescent light when it was bright, it was uh, a sort of a, uh, it had a particular sort of a kind of white. And if you dimmed it, it would be a more reddish kind of white. And then LEDs came along and, and you try that with your dimmer and it starts off as, a, as that kind of uh, daylight kind of white and you dim it down and it doesn't change color. It stays as a kind of very blue rich white. It looks sort of ghostly and thin and awful. It doesn't have that nice sort of candlelight look when you dim it. But there are new LEDs that that uh, change color when you dim them, and uh, it's called for uh, Philips makes a lot of them, and it's called Warm Glow. So that's what I use on my porch. We we have a dimmer, we have these Philips Warm Glow light bulbs, and we dim them down, and it changes from 2700K to 2200K uh, when it dims. So that when it's dim, it's a nice uh, uh, warm. It looks good to the eye, and it has less negative impact on uh, on the outdoors. Uh, but I also choose the lights, uh, light bulbs carefully for the outdoors so they go down only. I put them in a fixture that's fully shielded so the light goes down only um, and I turn it off when I'm not actually using it. Great. Um, just a clarifying um, comment that builds on Alan's question. So um, you can get any colored LED, you know, when you're thinking of like Christmas lights kind of thing. Is the color really changing the um, the warmth of the light, or is that just a filter that's on the LED? They're both true. Yeah, it's a filter that's changing the color, which is changing the warmth. And uh, the the bad news for let's see, the bad news for wildlife is uh, that any light at night is bad, and blue light is worse for most species, but not even all species. Like we talked about fireflies, Avalon Owens has done some experiments that show that. Uh, that that uh, for fireflies, actually amber light is the worst. Amber light is the best for most other species. So you can't win, can you? No, you can't. We should just turn the lights off. Uh, with that said, um, I see, um, oh, sorry, can I jump ahead to a question here? Oh, yes, you may, yes. Leslie Glenn, is there any movement focused on mandating all public street lights to be 3000 K or less? There sure is. That is in our state bill uh, that, that any, any lights, any outdoor lights funded by the state of Massachusetts or any municipality in Massachusetts shall be no bluer than 3000K. It would be the first state in the nation to do that. So we dark sky advocates are all over this, but there's a lot of pushback. The utilities push back extremely strongly against this idea. They hate it. 
lighting designers hate it. They want to be able to use blue lights to to make you know cool effects, and uh, and we're ruining their fun. Sorry, guys. That, that's the way it is. Well, I'll um, I'll share the recording of this uh, tomorrow, and I'll include a link to the bill um, and Please, thank information you. to to write to representatives. Great. We encourage everyone to do so. A uh, question from Mark. Um, how does light coming out of windows at night affect light pollution? Is that a significant source of light pollution? Uh, it's minor compared to everything else. Um, street lights are the single biggest. Street lights and parking lot lights in most municipalities are the biggest source of light pollution. Uh, you know, all those maps I showed you from uh, uh, Boston, elsewhere in Massachusetts, you can follow very easily uh, the the highways and even the small roads. And it's not because there are houses there casting their lights out, it's because there are street lights uh, and parking lots. With that said, th that accounts for less than 50% of all light pollution. And the rest comes from everything else, which is uh, you know, porch lights and, um, and a yieldy uh, carriage lamp in the, in the front yard and, uh, and uh, uh, used car lots and uh, downtown lights of all kinds. Um, uh, if your house is out in the middle of nowhere in the woods and there are no street lights and there's no used car uh, lot, then of course, 100% of the light pollution is coming from your house. And uh, if you have the shades open uh, and there's light coming out uh, uh, to the outside, then 100% of the light pollution is, is from your house. But it's small, like a couple of percent compared to all those other things we talked about. Um, could you explain a little bit more about the science that causes insects to be attracted to outdoor lights? No, <laughs> um, I, I don't know. You know, there's a whole class of insects that are attracted to light and, and um, the, uh, the, I don't think the experts know necessarily why that is. Uh, and, uh, and unfortunately, I, I just have to defer to them, and I don't think they know either. And if they do, they, they haven't told me. Uh, so I should ask them that, that very good basic question, but I'm afraid uh, we're, we're reaching the end of you know, my expertise in uh, insect biology. Uh, so I think, it's, uh, I think it's largely a, um, uh, a uh, uh, population level effect. That is to say, they know that populations of insects are attracted to light. Uh, some populations are, some populations are not. Uh, you, can, you can say definitely this species is, this species is not. But I don't think it's known at a, you know, the biological mechanism why that happens. Uh, Susan asks, uh, are there any examples of motion detectors being used on street lights? Yes, but not here. Um, the motion detectors that I'm aware of on street lights are mostly in Northern Europe, uh, in uh, Germany and Scandinavia, uh, where there are um, smart cities that have adopted the, the idea that, oh, okay, we've got all this technology available, uh, let's use it. Um, and uh, they, they put motion detectors in their street light systems so that the street lights are just off until uh, bicyclist or a pedestrian or even a car comes along and is detected and a light comes on in a wave, a rolling wave that illuminates the street ahead of the, the motion and then turns off afterwards. Uh, that has its own problems. For example, it uses uh, radar, which ruins radio astronomy. Uh, but and you can't uh, win, right? <laughs> you can't win. You can't win. Uh, but it, 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 does, it does happen. It, does, it can work. That technology is coming. And um, all of this, the streetlight technology might be obsolete in as soon as a decade anyway with driverless cars, which don't need streetlights to see anyway. That's, it's strictly for the humans who are driving the car that we have the streetlights. So all of this may really be a, a rapidly changing landscape in, uh, in as little as 10 years. Yeah, it's fascinating. Um, any last questions? Please put them in the chat. Uh, Another comment from Mark, uh, is it better to leave a low level outdoor light on or to put in motion detecting? Lighting? 
Uh, yeah, you know, you could do a simple calculation yourself and just figure out, well, how many minutes is it on and how many watts is it using or how many lumens is it using and just multiply those out and see what's the total effect, how much light, you think how many watts are you using to, to send that light out for a given night and you want to minimize that. Um, I would say do both, right? Use as low wattage, as low illumination as you can get away with and use the motion detector and, and the timer. So use all of those. I'm happy to see somebody here from the Weston Planning Board. That's, we, we, need, uh, we need your help. Well, I think that's all we have for questions. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming and for uh, to especially to Bryn and Jeff and the Lincoln Land Conservation Trust. So so happy to have you carrying this uh, torch, shall we say? Sorry, one last question from David: um, How much light pollution is is um, local in nature? Local in nature. Yeah, um, um, the idealized case. So suppose you yeah. turned off all the lights in Lincoln. What would the what would light pollution be like? Right. Um, what you would what you would gain would be um, an immediate uh, elimination of light shining directly on anything. Uh, so you would have um, uh, you would have a much better view of everything. It would be better for all the, all the problems we talked about would be would be lessened, but you would still have sky glow. So how much sky glow would you have? Um, I'm going to guess you would have at least a factor of two less sky glow. Uh, given the size of Lincoln, you know, it's, it's, a, it's roughly 10 miles across. Um, uh, you would very clearly see um, that Boston was much lighter uh, you know, the sky was much lighter on, on the Boston side uh, than on the side towards, uh, towards Worcester. Um, and the sky would be darker overhead by, I'm gonna guess at least a factor of two. To do that calculation carefully is really complicated. And there are people who do this. Um, my colleague Martin Aubet at the um, Observatoire, um, uh, sorry, it's called, it's the um, uh, Mont Megantique, Mount Megantique, in southern Quebec. He is the world expert on, on running computer models where he looks at the individual streetlights in a given city and where they are and whether they're, they're blocked by buildings or hills or trees and how bright they are and what their design is and, and what happened if you replace them with this and that. And, uh, and what is the, the effect on melatonin suppression? What is the effect on sky glow? This can be modeled, but it's complicated. Well, thank you. This was fascinating and hopefully inspired um, someone to raise their hand at town meeting and see if, uh, right, see if right. we can do anything more about reducing light pollution in Lincoln. Um, so thank you again and um, thank you. Have a Brent. wonderful night. You're out to look at the stars tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Night, everyone.